Quantum computing startups have raised billions of dollars. But what's the outcome? Where is the supercomputing future that we were promised? I have spent a hundred hours digging through peer-reviewed research papers and industry analytics from diverse fields – computer science, quantum computing, and even neuroscience and climate. And what I learned was really surprising. The biggest reason we need quantum computers is not what the mainstream media usually talks about. And it's not about the computing power. To understand what it's all about, we will begin at an unusual place – a karate club. In 1976, anthropologist Wayne Zachary published a paper that showed how the flows of information within social networks influence their structure. For about three years, Zachary followed the members of a university karate club. Eventually, the relationships between members soured so much that they split into two competing factions. Over time, those factions broke out into separate clubs. Friendships within the club hinted at this division years before it happened. In the end, Zachary designed a mathematical model that used the early structure of the Karate Club network to forecast its future evolution. And Zachary's model was so precise that it predicted the outcome with a 97% accuracy. Over the years, network scientists realized that Zachary's approach actually applies to many other real-world networks. For instance, neurons within our brains form networks, as do airline routes. And even local clusters of weather can act as nodes in a larger climate network. If we could accurately trace the present structure of those networks, we could predict their future behavior. Now, as you can imagine, those networks are absolutely massive. And this makes any simulation super costly from a computational perspective. Take the human brain, for example. It's made up of billions of neurons and trillions of synapses. Together, they form a vast network called the connectome. And it makes you, you. The connections within the brain explain how it behaves or misbehaves. For example, the connectome structures called pathological networks are responsible for a variety of mental health conditions, such as depression. And if we could map the connectome, we could answer the fundamental questions about the human mind. In 2013, the European Union tried to do just that. 500 scientists spent about 10 years trying to build a low-fidelity map of the human brain and then to simulate the brain in a supercomputer. In the end, they discovered six new brain regions that are responsible for things like memory, language, and even music processing. The more we can learn about the structure of the brain, the more progress we can make in biology, psychology, and even computer science. But over 10 years, the European project has only scratched the surface of what's possible. The brain is so complex that even the modern hardware and algorithms are just too weak to go deeper. Imagine we want to simulate the brain in real time, down to electrical and chemical interactions between neurons. We would need a supercomputer that is capable of about 10 to the power of 25 floating point operations per second. In 2023, the world's fastest supercomputer is Frontier from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Its peak performance stands at about 10 to the power of 18 flops. So we basically need something that's 10 million times more powerful than Frontier. Easy, right? And if we wanted to run that simulation for a year, we would need about 10 to the power of 8 terawatt hours of energy, which is around 1000 times more than the entire world produced in 2022. These numbers are so large, they're meaningless. Let's take a look at a simple example that can explain why. Imagine that I have 12 neurons, some of which are connected with synapses. I want to find a synaptic path that goes through each of them. But I'm not looking for just any path. That would have been easy. I'm looking for a path that goes through each neuron exactly once. This is called a Hamiltonian path, and it's useful for things like finding the groups of neurons that work together. It's also handy for other things like genome mapping or the design of electronic circuits. So I have a couple of options here. First, I could take a brute force approach and manually check all the combinations. In this case, it's a factorial of 12, and this leaves me with about 479 million possible combos. If I do this by hand, and if I'm really efficient and spend no more than 30 seconds on each combination, I could probably finish this task in about 457 years. There has to be a better way. Luckily for me, there is an algorithm that can find a Hamiltonian path in 2 to the power of n multiplied by n to the power of 2 steps, where n is the number of nodes. 
For us it's just 12 neurons, which leaves me with 589,824 iterations. I'm down to just 7 months of work here. Well, that's an improvement, but you see this 2 to the power of n? Computer scientists would say that this algorithm solves the problem in exponential time. And that's not good at all. For an algorithm to have any practical use, it has to be much faster and it has to solve a problem in at least polynomial time. n to the power of 2 would have been really nice here. And this is where the reality hits hard. The human brain, for instance, has about 86 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses connecting them. Social, economic and ecological networks show similar levels of complexity and have countless nodes. And the complexity shoots way up if we account for the non-linear interactions within those networks, such as the uptake of neurotransmitters in the brain or the flows of liquids in the atmosphere. Most computer scientists agree that many useful real-world problems are exceptionally hard to solve. They call them non-deterministic polynomial problems, or NP. And there are actually two subclasses of NP problems. NP-hard and NP-complete. Many of those NP problems are key to understanding the world around us. And as we learned from our brain example, even the most advanced supercomputers are not capable of solving those problems in any reasonable time. And by reasonable, I mean before the universe expires. The trillion dollar question is, can quantum computers make any difference? Most researchers think that quantum computers could solve many NP problems that classical computers just can't handle. They call this quantum supremacy or quantum advantage. In 2019, a team at Google used quantum computer to solve a problem that would have taken a conventional supercomputer about 10,000 years to crack. Google proudly declared quantum supremacy. The nice thing about quantum supremacy is that this is a very well-defined engineering milestone. But there was a catch. The problem they solved didn't have any practical use. And in 2021, a group of Chinese scientists designed an algorithm that solved the exact same problem in about 5 days. And they used 60 off-the-shelf NVIDIA GPUs. Not even a supercomputer. But this doesn't mean that quantum computers are a fad. We just don't know what useful NP problems they could tackle. And we also don't have enough quantum algorithms to help us get the most out of hardware. And so we are back to algorithms. When most people think of improvements to computing, they automatically think of Moore's law and hardware. Every couple of years we double the amount of transistors on a microchip, and that's where the performance boost comes from. But this raw power is just half the picture. Historically, improvements to algorithms led to spikes in computing speed. In the past 50 years, we managed to speed up many algorithms from exponential to polynomial. This was especially true for big data problems. There, algorithms improved 43% faster than hardware on a yearly basis. After decades of hard work, computer scientists designed about 900 useful algorithms. But the pace of development has slowed down in recent years. Between 1970 and 2000, we designed about 300 new algorithms. Between 2000 and 2020, we barely managed to cough up a little over 20. We're really scraping the bottom of the barrel here. And that's exactly why a completely new approach to computing could make a difference. All quantum startups essentially made a bet that their hardware could help us find new algorithms to tackle intractable problems. And those problems have a name. They call them bounded error quantum polynomial problems. But the field of quantum computing is in its infancy. 100 years ago, we had less than 300 classical algorithms. Modern quantum computing is not even close to that. Researchers have only found and tested just 45 quantum algorithms by now. To make quantum computing truly useful, we need to 10x that amount. And this is where I have to tell you something. There are actually not one, but two different types of quantum computers. On the one hand, we have quantum annealers like this computer from D-Wave. I won't go into the technical details here, but what you have to know is that annealers are excellent at solving a narrow range of NP-hard optimization problems. For instance, they can find the best combination of aircraft, airline routes and ticket fares to maximize revenue and minimize fuel consumption. Believe it or not, this problem has so many variables that it's practically impossible to solve in a classical computer. When you hear the news about a top 500 company using quantum computers in their business, chances are it's some kind of quantum annealer. And while annealers are effective at optimization, the most important scientific and engineering problems are not optimization problems. So we need something else here. 
And this is where the other type comes in. Those are the quantum computers based on so-called quantum gates. This architecture is similar to classical computers. Quantum gates enable a large number of quantum logic operations, and in theory, this flexibility could help us design new classes of algorithms. But the gate-based computers are notoriously hard to build. You've probably heard the term quantum error correction. Qubits in gate-based computers lose their properties in microseconds. This behavior is called quantum decoherence, and it leads to errors in computation. Preventing and fixing them is so hard that some researchers believe it would be just easier to ditch the entire effort and build an entirely new type of quantum hardware. Regardless of how we go about this, quantum computing is an expensive and ambitious bet that may not pay off. But we don't have much choice. The progress in classical computing will slow down significantly after the 2040s. And this is because we're quickly approaching a fundamental physical limit called the Landauer's limit. Here's a simple explanation. When transistors flip from 0 to 1, they generate heat. The more transistors we pack on a chip, the more cooling it needs. Otherwise, the whole thing just overheats and fails to store information. But that heat is progressively harder to remove the smaller we make those transistors and the tighter we squeeze them on a microchip. At some point, thermal energy leaks to neighboring transistors and the entire microchip goes out of service. At Landauer's limit, and if our transistor is small enough, that heat is enough to flip its nearest neighbor. And by small, I mean one nanometer in size. It gets worse though. Such tiny transistors will be so sensitive to heat that they will be flipping randomly even at room temperatures. And we'll face this problem soon. The smallest transistor today is about 3 nanometers in diameter, and we place them around 48 nanometers away from each other. Semiconductor industry experts forecast that sometime in the 2030s we will reach the physical limits of miniaturization. And beyond that, we don't have a clear path forward. As you can see, we're in a tough spot. First, we're not designing new algorithms. Second, we're running out of hardware improvements. Quantum computers could help us solve both of those challenges, but classical computers will not go out of business even when that happens. We will still have problems that quantum computers are simply not good for. In her recent viral video about quantum computers, Cleo Abram came up with an elegant metaphor comparing them to boats exploring the treasures of the ocean. But I prefer a different analogy. Imagine that every computing problem is like a food dish, and classical computers are like salt. It doesn't matter what the dish is, it can be meat, vegetables, even dessert. And salt will make them better. But if you're really into cooking, you probably want to dial up the flavor a little bit. And this is where quantum computers could help, figuratively speaking. Quantum computers are like fermented hot sauce. It adds a lot of flavor, but also a lot of funk. God forbid you put it on a cake. But if you find the right combo, it will brighten up the entire dish. Most researchers believe that quantum computers and classical computers will work in tandem, and this could lead to unexpected shifts in technology. When Nvidia released its first graphics processor in the early 90s, the company didn't expect the GPUs to become the cornerstone of modern AI. But look at where we are today. And quantum computers are exactly like GPUs in that sense. They will accelerate classical computers by handling a narrow range of specific tasks. The folks at NVIDIA understand this well. The company has recently developed a GPU-accelerated interface between quantum and classical computers. So it seems like everyone is getting ready for the quantum revolution. But will it actually happen? By now, quantum computing has attracted a mind-boggling amount of financing, almost $5 billion in the past two years alone. And thousands of researchers and engineers have bet their careers on the success of this field. So when will we see something truly useful coming out of this? The optimists believe that we will have reliable and useful quantum computers sometime by 2035. And uh, maybe earlier if we're lucky. The pessimists think that we will have to wait quite a bit longer, until late 40s and maybe even 50s. And some go as far as to say that we're actually on the brink of the quantum winter, and soon enough most projects will run out of funding. But we have been here before. Artificial intelligence has survived not one, but two winters. There's been almost no progress in the 1970s and a massive slump in the early 90s. And we all know how that ended. But let's say the doomsayers are right. What are the viable alternatives to quantum computers? Unfortunately, right now we don't have any. But not all is lost. 
unconventional approaches like spintronics, laser computing and neuromorphic computing are showing some promise. Speaking of neuromorphic computing, I recently made a video about the technology that uses human brain cells for computation. I really recommend that you check it out, because that's the closest thing to science fiction I've seen in a while. I linked it to the very end of this video. Thank you for watching. This video was sponsored by me. And it would help me a lot if you could subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next episode. See you next time.